A new scientific technique can now produce human stem cells for the first time. Some say it advances the search for medical treatments. Others call for new laws to prevent cloning for ethical reasons. So, should we be using the technology to clone human stem cells? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Rida Fakhri. We all remember Dolly the sheep, the first cloned animal. Well, scientists in the United States using similar methods that created Dolly have now managed to produce embryos to clone human stem cells. And as Alan Fisher now explains, scientists are calling it a medical breakthrough. The technique isn't new. The results are microscopic genetic material was taken from an adult cell. It was then inserted into an egg whose own DNA had been stripped out. This creates human embryonic stem cells, which are capable of becoming any of the more than 200 types of cells that make up a person. That's important because those cells could be used to treat devastating conditions such as multiple sclerosis, spinal cord injuries, heart disease, or even Parkinson's. Most of patients uh, don't have the uh, ability to regenerate these tissues, uh, for example, if it's been damaged during disease. Um, and uh, fortunately, now we have a technique where we could take uh, any other cell, in this case, of course, skin cell, and turn them into early embryonic. And now these embryonic cells, they're grown in a petri dish. Now they can produce now these heart cells or neurons that this patient needs. Since the same technique produced Dolly the clone sheep in 1996, scientists have been trying to create human stem cells. One Korean scientist claimed success in 2005, but this was a lie in one of the most notorious cases of scientific fraud in the last 10 years. The same team behind this latest breakthrough managed to clone monkeys with this technique back in 2007, a significant step. Embryonic stem cell research has repeatedly raised ethical concerns. What it does is it literally uh, opens the door to in vitro fertilization labs using these principles to make clones uh, for people that might want to have a clone. The technique used in Oregon is called somatic cell nuclear transfer. What the team in Oregon has done is take an adult skin cell and inserted it into a human egg stripped of its existing DNA. The unfertilized eggs are stimulated by electric pulses and that starts them dividing. Scientists say the results from Oregon are hugely significant, a major step forward in the field and in the fight against some terrible diseases. Alan Fisher, Al Jazeera. As we mentioned earlier, the first attempt at cloning took place over 15 years ago. Dolly the sheep was cloned by scientists in Scotland in 1996. Since then, the process has been carried out on dogs, mice and other animal species. Although it uses a similar technique, many experts say the new research using human embryonic stem cells cannot be used to clone humans. An alternative and far less controversial way of creating stem cells is already available. It involves reprogramming mature cells, which are often taken from the skin. And it allows scientists to sidestep ethical issues because there is no need to use embryos. So just how important a breakthrough is this new scientific achievement and can it eventually lead to human cloning? Let's discuss this with our guests in Newcastle, Lyle Armstrong from the Institute of Genetic Medicine at the University of Newcastle upon Tyne. In London, Josephine Quintavale, Director of Core Ethics. That's an organization that comments on reproductive ethics. Also in London, David King, Director and Founder of Human Genetics Alert. Lyle Armstrong, just how much of a major step forward is this in the treatment of serious uh, diseases and medical conditions? Well, for many years we've been trying to produce pluripotent stem cells, those things which can give rise to any of the tissues that we'd find in an adult's body, uh, which are not going to be rejected by that body. So it's important in that the uh, work that Metalipova has done can generate embryonic stem cells which are patient specific. Whether or not that has any real impact medically remains to be seen because there are other 
methods for generating the, these stem cells, such as making induced pluripotent stem cells or adult stem cells. So it's very difficult to say whether it will have any medical impact at this stage. But is human cloning now made more possible, even more likely, as a result of this breakthrough, as many people have argued? Well, of course, if you can make a human embryo, then at least in theory you could implant it into a woman's uterus where it would develop potentially into a human being. Um, strictly speaking, that is illegal in most countries, but of course just because something is illegal doesn't mean that an unscrupulous individual won't attempt it. Um, it is a theoretical possibility that human cloning could have been brought a step forward by this development. Josephine Quintavalli, what is your main objection to using human stem cell uh, research, this type of new technique, if it is going to save lives and cure some of the more serious degenerative diseases? Well, I think we have to first look at the issue of it's unethical. You would actually be destroying a human embryo in order to try theoretically to save somebody else's life. So human life begins at the embryo stage. So that's a big ethical controversy. The other issue, of course, is safety. I come from a country that's done a lot of animal cloning and they turned down, their, they uh, closed their center for animal cloning because of the high degree of abnormality that was resulting. So New Zealand is a leading agricultural country which turned its back on animal cloning, uh, which is a procedure that's involved in this case. But the other issue, which I think in a way Professor Armstrong touched on is, I would say it's also unnecessary there are other ways of, achieve, of achieving the cures that they're looking for. Uh, he mentioned induced pluripotent stem cells, which is allegedly what they want to do through the, the cloning process. Nobel Prize winner uh, Professor Yamanaka was awarded the uh, Nobel Prize for the work he's done in producing these cells, induced pluripotent stem cells, without going through the cloning process. So I've been saying very clearly, I think we're whipping a dead donkey here this is yesterday's science and I think they could close down what they're doing there in, in, in the United States and focus on wh where the real future lies in this area of regenerative medicine. David King, do you also feel that there are better alternatives that already exist, some that are less risky, less costly and obviously some that don't bring up the issue of uh, the, whether or not it, it is ethical to deal with this type of uh, technique? Um, I certainly agree that there are some, some much better alternatives available. Um, we have to remember that this whole, uh, cl the whole cloning thing is purely in order to make the stem cells um, genetically matched to the patient. But when you do that, you actually introduce a set of genetic flaws into those cells, which are the same genetic flaws which are, uh, produce the abnormalities if you try and Im implant the embryos in animals that the Josephine Quintavalli just mentioned. So, in trying to get the match to the patient, you introduce a, a whole new bunch of risks to the patient. Um, you know, to me that doesn't really make sense. And uh, I, what I see with this is a real kind of um, sort of worship of high technology, really, for almost for the sake of, of, of high technology. Um, the fact is that this, the, you know, if you were ever to try to apply this in, in routine clinical medicine, the cost would be way beyond anything that we do now because you're, you're trying to, you, you have to extract eggs um, from women for, air, for every patient and that's, an, that's a big ethical issue in itself. Um, you know, clone the embryo, create stem cells, um, turn those stem cells into, into the tissues that you want. Um, just extraordinarily uh, expensive and, you know, would require thousands of people to be trained in the very difficult uh, techniques of embryo manipulation. It's, it's really highly unrealistic that this, this would ever work and what we see is this sort of hype machine going on every time one of these papers is published. Actually the benefits are going to be rather small I think. Lyle Armstrong, so some people obviously are arguing that there are better ways of, of dealing with the situation with the existing uh, techniques available. Why then would one invest so much in this new technique? Well, for, uh, for several years I've been interested, as I said earlier, in making stem cells for individual human beings. And one of the first ways that I examined to do that was the technique that Metalopov has, has published. We were unsuccessful in deriving 
embryonic stem cells from cloned human embryos. So we started to look at other ways we could generate cells and fortunately a technique was pioneered in Japan for which uh, a, a, a researcher over there won the Nobel Prize last year called induced pluripotent stem cell technology which we use almost exclusively now to generate stem cell lines for individual human beings. We've made over 400 lines in our, in our laboratory which seem to fulfill all of the characteristics of the cells that Metalipoff is producing through cloning. So as far as we're concerned we don't need nuclear transfer cloning as a means of producing stem cells. As David King correctly said it would be so expensive to put into practice and so cumbersome a technique to use that it really wouldn't be practical in any sense. Uh, Josephine Quintavale, how about the argument then made by many that this really advances uh, medicine in a very significant way, that it would in no way lead to the creation or cloning of whole human beings, that it, was, it would merely lead to uh, the production of new cells, brain cells, tissue, so on, uh, things that are needed uh, to advance medicine and to help cure diseases. What about this argument? Well, I mean, I reflect back on what Professor Armstrong has just said. I mean, he's basically saying it's not necessary. So we agree. In the past, I've often been in opposition to some of the proposals that were undertaken in Newcastle, but I totally agree with him. We can do this do the patient-specific stem cell without having to clone a human embryo, without running the risks. But what's for sure is what you start is you open the Pandora's box and it's very difficult to stop it. There are many, many people around who've often um, expressed the desire to clone themselves. So we don't want to work at a technology that might facilitate that, particularly when it's not necessary. So I've been saying in, in, in comments on this proposal that it's yesterday's science. I don't even know why it's hit the headlines. There are so many better ways to do the cures that we're trying to do. We haven't even talked about adult stem cells where you're not, you know, not involving uh, anything in particular, any way controversial, things like cord blood stem cells. I'd love to hear a program dedicated to the cures that have been affected over the last over 20 years, I think, decades, where we've been using adult stem cells and not getting involved at all in any of this controversy. But the induced pluripotent stem cell discovery by Yamanaka was justifi justifiably, he was awarded the Nobel Prize. It's groundbreaking, it's exciting, and here we have a panel for once who all agree. But, but much of the controversy, David King, has to do with the fact not only that uh, some embryos obviously would have to be destroyed in the process, but that this could potentially eventually lead to the cloning of human beings. How do you react, though, to the statements made by the researchers, the scientists themselves who've advanced this new technique, when they say that this simply is not their focus, that they are merely focused on, and I quote them, on uh, the use of this technique in future treatments to combat disease? Oh, I've no reason to disbelieve them that, it's no, that that's no, their focus is not on uh, cloning a human being, but that's not really enough. Um, you know, uh, scientists have to take responsibility for uh, for the you know the the possible uh, implications of their their work and and the way that other people can can use and abuse it. And we see this already with, for example, uh, research on on biological weapons, where there is. Uh, you know, scientists are, are, are be, be, being very careful about, you know, openly publishing uh, information that could, uh, you know, allow terrorists to start developing biological weapons. Um, he, you know, he, it's, uh, it's all very well for him to say, well, um, uh, we're not trying to do human cloning. But the fact is that other people could. And what you have, unfortunately, as Josephine Quintavale mentioned, is um, a very big, uh, a very big potential market for that. And a, and a, uh, sadly, quite a lot of uh, IVF doctors who uh, who will be very happy to exploit that market, who actually don't have any ethical problem uh, with human cloning. They see no problem with uh, creating, you know, uh, identical people, um, genetically identical people, I should say. Um, so that that is a big worry, and that's why we've been um, arguing for a uh, an inter a really enforceable international ban on on human cloning with, with penalties um, before you start
publishing techniques that allow people to do it. Well, Unfortunately, uh, they've, these scientists have gone ahead anyway. Lila Armstrong, just how easily then, uh, how easily misused can this technique be by people who have no problem with uh, reproducing copies of other human beings. I know there are bans in place in some 16 states in the US, including California since 1997, uh, the year after the announcement was made about the cloning of Dolly the sheep. Uh, so what kind of safeguards really can be put in place against this? It's very difficult to imagine how that could be done because if even a graduate student, if they are experienced or have even seen somatic cell nuclear transfer, the cloning process being done, they can learn to replicate it. Um, the equipment obviously is um, expensive, it's not readily available, but it can be acquired. Um, it's not impossible that you could imagine a rogue cloning lab setting up in, in someone's garage, for example. But the key issue is can they get access to women who are willing to subject themselves to having this cloned embryo implanted and growing inside them? That's probably going to be the main way in which we could regulate how this procedure would take place. Most women who have uh, reproductive issues would go to an IVF clinic for test tube baby production. Um, the only way an embryo could be implanted would be to use the services of a gynaecologist who is trained in that procedure. So we need much tighter regulations of how those people are allowed to work, what qualifications they can do, they can take, and what procedures they're allowed to, to, to undertake. But there is always the outside chance that someone could, could you know, in a particular renegade state could do it without too much hindrance. But if this, if this new technique, though, is so similar to the one that was used back in 1996 to clone Dolly the sheep, what then prevents it uh, from being used on humans? And Josephine Quintavalle, is this one of your main concerns? Well, talking about implanting a cloned human embryo, I would recommend to anybody who, who considers this a good idea to read the reports from New Zealand, from the government agency, when they closed down our animal cloning centre. I am from New Zealand originally. To see what kind of abnormalities resulted, one of the most frightening from my perspective is, is called large um, offspring syndrome, where the developing animal is too large to be contained in the uterus of the gestating um, mother. Can you imagine if that happens in a human condition? The baby's too big and, 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 it, and the, the mother risks almost, you know, in layman's terms, exploding. The abnormalities were so significant that the New Zealand government, a leading agricultural country, decided to, to close their cloning station, which was not very far from where I used to live in New Zealand. Read that and think if you think it's a good idea to clone a human, a human being. But I think definitely, I agree with everybody, there will always be rogue people people who think it's a good idea. Even uh, ever but since again, Dolly, but again, the Dolly researchers the themselves say this isn't the focus of this technique. It's not the, it's not the focus, but I'm suggesting the that intention. the focus is an unnecessary... It, well, I, don't, I, I admit that, but once the technology has been developed, it's not going to be difficult to replicate. But what I keep saying is that it's not necessary. Not only is it unethical and dangerous, it's simply not necessary. And it would be wonderful to celebrate the, the, the great science that's given us stem cell technology and helped us to cure diseases with these very, very creative cells. But no, it's an absolute no to cloning. Well, as you can imagine, uh, this issue has been generating a lot of reaction on Facebook. Uh, Nora Suedi says stem cells should be used to cure and not to create a whole new life, just to assist the ones existing. Interesting breakthrough, but an unethical practice, she says. Breck Bashadi Suleiman simply says we've gone too far. Anne-Marie McLennan adds stop playing God. And Mariam Jan says I completely support it for its potential breakthrough in fighting many diseases. Maybe a further research it has the potential for many other cures. We have to allow science to move forward. David King, how do you then allow science to move forward if you put so many ethical obstacles in the way? Um, well, I, I find that an, an odd question, to be honest with you. Um, I, I, 
it, to me, I mean, I, I, my background is as, as a scientist. Uh, I did a PhD in molecular biology. Um, I, of course, uh, you know, I'm happy for science to go forward. But for me, you know, as a human being, the first thing is you get the ethics right. Uh, ethics has to set the limits to everything. And I find it odd that people think in the, think in the way of, well, uh, you know, the, 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 actually the real imperative is to let science go forward no matter what the cost, no matter what the ethics. Uh, and somehow the fact that science goes forward is, 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 uh, is, is the overall goal. Uh, that to me gets the well in English we say put put the cart before the horse um, you know I think we have to get get the get the ethics right first Lyle Armstrong do you first have to get the ethics right do I know how to get the ethics right well obviously the tissue has to come from someone to to to, to reprogram in this cloning technique it's it's very, any procedure that we undergo in our university, we have to fill in a full ethical application, informing the patient what will happen to their, to their material, to their, their skin samples. Even if it's just simple taking a blood sample and performing some DNA analysis on it. But the point I tried to make before is that it, it's very difficult to put laws in place if people choose not to obey them. But the counter argument though For is example, why, even go, why even go this far if you don't need to, if alternatives already exist? I, I, I couldn't agree more. What Metalipov has done is interesting from a scientific perspective. It can be used to answer all sorts of questions as to how the the, the material in a human egg cell interacts with incoming DNA. But that's probably as far as it goes. There are other much better ways, much cheaper ways of achieving the same goal. So I really don't see why we need to go down this therapeutic cloning route. A few years ago, I would have said otherwise because there really were no alternatives to making pluripotent stem cells. And we've had this, I personally have had this discussion with Josephine on many occasions. But now there are better ways to do it, and I don't see why we really need to resort to cloning. Uh, Josephine Quintavalli, just uh, once more to be clear, it, is this a gladden. complete red line for you, or are there sometimes ifs and buts? And off I don't think there again. are any ifs and buts. I don't think there are any ifs and buts about this and it's a delight for me to hear Professor Armstrong speaking so clearly in, in, in telling us that things have moved forward and we can put this all behind us because that's what the message is coming through. This is unnecessary. So it's dangerous, it's unethical and we're also understanding very clearly that it's not necessary. But even if it were necessary, or not necessary, but even if there were no alternatives, I think man has got to be greater than that and has to learn when to say no. We haven't had much focus on women's rights in this issue, but in many of the new reproductive technologies there's a colossal burden put on women to provide genetic materials through eggs, and egg donation is not an easy process to undergo. And some of the, um, the, the studies from this new research did require a considerable invasion of women's bodies. I think, as I said, earlier. This to my mind is definitely yesterday's science. It's not where we are today. We do have other ways of achieving the justifiable ther therapies that we're looking for and that's how we should move forward. Uh, David King, once again, to you the pitfalls outweigh the, the advantages of any such research. Yes, I think, uh, I think they do. Uh, I mean, I've, I've, I've can't say it better than uh, Josephine Quintavalli and Professor Armstrong have said it, that, that yes, um, the benefits uh, that uh, despite all the hype that there is around them, the benefits are rather small, um, whereas the risks are, are, are quite severe. I just want to uh, enlarge just a little bit on this point that Josephine raised about um, the, the risks to women. Some of my colleagues in the, in the USA picked up on an interesting point about that if you looked at the details of this paper, what, they, um, what the scientists did, uh, what they discovered was that if you use less severe drugs in stimulating the egg donors, uh, then 
uh, you get better quality eggs and so that's one of the factors that enabled them to have success with this research. We'll have to leave our discussion here. Let me thank you all though for joining us in this uh, debate in Newcastle, Lyle Armstrong in London, Josephine Quintavalle and in London as well, David King. And thank you of course as always for joining us on Inside Story. If you want you can send us your feedback, you can email us your thoughts to InsideStory at aljazeera.net. From Miri Dafahri and the team, thanks for watching.